It's fantastic to be here, and USB, you guys are in a different league. You really, really are. I've been running my company for 18 years, and we use motivational speakers all the time. And um, USB is as, as an agency that deals with speakers and help with assisting with speakers. You guys really, really are incredible. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Mount Everest. We all know it's the highest mountain in the world, but I want to share some statistics with you that you may not be aware of. 64 years ago, the first two men that summited that magnificent mountain, sorry, let me take you onto the mountain, that mountain took two months to climb, and I've got to get you up there and down there in 15 minutes. It's going to be a fast climb. 64 years ago, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay made it to the top of Mount Everest. In the last 64 years, there are only 4,052 people that have stood on top of the world. In South Africa, there are only 28 South Africans, and on the 19th of May 2013, I became the third South African woman to summit Mount Everest. So outside of climbing mountains and doing endurance events, I have been running my company for nearly 20 years, and we use motivational speakers, as I said earlier. And it was in June 2012, we were doing a roadshow for a medical aid company, and we used Lewis Pugh. I'm sure you know Lewis is also known as the human polar bear. And I was so inspired by this guy. I really was. It was on the Friday. And on the Sunday, I made a decision. I picked up my phone, and I sent Lewis an email. I said, Lewis, I've made a decision to attempt to summit Mount Everest. And he emailed me back immediately, he said, Lee, there's three things. Number one, you can do anything in your life if you believe it's possible. Number two, I'd love you to meet my friend Sibu Sisu Bilani. Sibu is the first African man. He climbed from the north and the south. And then number three, the most important information in that email, he said, you must go with the right expedition company. It's a dangerous mountain. A lot of people have lost their lives on Everest. You must go with the right company. What do we do today when we, when we need information? I was so excited, I went to work on Monday and I went in, onto Google and I put one question in there. How do I climb Mount Everest? And two very important facts came through the inf information I was reading. Number one, that mountain takes two months to climb. For anybody heading up an apartment or running a company, it's a massive amount of time to step out of what you're doing. I'd only ever done one mountain in my life, which was Kilimanjaro, which was 14 years ago. Big difference, Kili is four days up and it's two days down, and Everest is two months. The second piece of information, which I had no idea, is that Everest would cost me 600,000 Rand for this personal adventure and expedition. And I kept on thinking to myself, if I'm going to spend this kind of money to be able to sit at a dinner table with my friends one day saying, you know what, guys, I made it to the top of the world, would be pretty much selfish and ego-driven. And I remember having coffee with a friend of mine, Kate, one day. I said, you know what, Kate, I'm heading to the highest point in the world. Who in South Africa would need raising money, raising awareness? And she said, you know, Lee, there's an amazing group of children living out of the Hattie Bearsburg Dam. For anybody who doesn't know where that is, if you had to drive literally 50 minutes from here, that's where it is. It's an informal settlement. And I will never forget, ladies and gentlemen, the first time I started meeting these children. I met a little boy who was nine years old, and he was taking care of his five-year-old sister. And I said to one of the social workers, Sylvia, I said, but Sylvia, who's taking care of these kids? And she said, Lee, whoever will be kind to them. So I made this decision. I was going to attempt to summit Mount Everest and raise money and, and raise awareness for these children at the Hutchbeer's Burt Dam. And I did exactly that. Carp Blanche caught wind of my story, and there was a lot of publicity, and we raised a lot of money and went to the mountain. I had the opportunity on Cop Blanche to say I wanted to appeal to every single South African to climb the mountain with me so we could build a center for these children. And as I said, it's exactly what we did two years later. But now I'm going to take you onto the mountain. My biggest, biggest challenge on Everest was the cold. The very first night at base camp, it was minus 21 degrees. I'm sure you'll agree, as South Africans, we don't really know cold and snow. Even our winter days go up to 25, 26 degrees. When I showed my twin sister, Kim, this picture for the first time, she said, Lee, wasn't it a shock for you the first time you got into a bath? I said, Kim, it was a bigger shock when I saw my legs that hadn't shaven for two months. <laughs> that was a shock for me. I have to share, I've been doing this talk for the last three years, and I would find when I spoke to men and women in the audience, I find that women would come to me afterwards saying, Lee, tell us about the ablution facilities. So I'm going to tell you right now about the ablution facilities. There weren't any. I was the only woman in a group of 18 men for the two months, and it was so much easier for the guys. Trust me. There were no bathrooms and no showers. Definitely not on Mount Everest. When I filled out my... My forms, I found an expedition company called Peak Freaks, a Canadian company, because in 2013 there was no um, South African expedition company take on, taking on Everest. 
There was one qu last question on this questionnaire. It said, do you require a personal Sherpa? Now, for anybody who doesn't know, the Sherpas are from Nepal. So what they do is they assist the climbers to get to the top of the world. It's very lucrative for them. It was an additional 5,000 US dollars, which so it wasn't a light decision. But I thought to myself, I'm a novice climber. It's a no-brainer. He'll push me, he'll pull me, he'll lead me, he'll guide me. He's going to help me get, get me to the top of, the, of Everest. Sorry, Justin, can I have a glass of water? If I never sip quickly. Thanks. Sorry about that. So I ticked it, ticked the box immediately. I thought, I'm a novice climber. I've got to, got to have my own personal Sherpa. The guy could hardly speak a word of English. His name was Sangi 3. I don't know who Sangi 2 was, and I've got no idea who Sangi 1 was. I don't know if you can see on that slide, um, I was wearing sunblock, which was 110 factor, every single day on Everest. And that's what my skin looked like when I got back to South Africa. That's how badly burnt my skin was. I got back on the Sunday. On Tuesday, I went to go and see a dermatologist here in Morningside, Dr. Levy. I walked in, I said, Dr. Levy, I'm panicking a bit. Can you tell? He said, Lee, relax. You've just had what women pay thousands for, a natural chemical pill. <laughs> I left lots of cream <laughs> and my skin healed very quickly. The things that I could not train for, the challenges on Everest, avalanches, Every single night at base camp, which was my home for two months, at 2, 3 in the morning, you'd hear these thunderous roar of avalanches coming down the side of the mountain. We were really fortunate that they didn't come close to our tents. The year after I was on that mountain in 2014, not one person summited Everest. They closed the mountain because 17 people lost their lives in one avalanche. The following year, not one person summited Everest. 16 people lost their lives in an avalanche. The Kumbu Icefall is something known as the most dangerous part of the climb. Okay, it extends directly from base camp. And in my main my keynote presentation, there's way more information, far more slides, and you see great, great visuals of this magnificent mountain. The reason why it's the most dangerous part of the climb is because there are massive crevices, crevices that run up to 100 meters in depth. When I was on that mountain for eight weeks, nine people died. Nine people lost their lives. One of them fell off that ladder down the crevice, and his body still lies at the bottom of that crevice. Those ladders may look pretty easy, but I have to share with you the specialized gear that you're wearing. The boots on my feet weighed four kilograms. The pack on your back is over 10 kilograms. We crossed those ladders up to 60 65 times. Every single day of Everest, there were helicopter rescues. Helicopter rescues for people that were not managing the cold. And if you're not managing the cold in that mountain, you're getting frostbite and people are losing fingers and toes. And the second reason why people were flown off the mountain was people not managing the altitude. The higher you go, the less oxygen. Above Camp 3, which is 7.1 kilometers, there's 30% oxygen. I want you to do a simple exercise. I want you to breathe in and breathe out. It's easy, right? In this room, it's about 95% oxygen. So you can imagine when you're at Camp 3 and there's only 30% oxygen, it's very, very difficult to breathe. You also have to hope if something happens to you medically that goes wrong, that it doesn't happen higher than Camp 2. A helicopter can't go higher than Camp 2. Camp 2 is at 6.4 kilometers. You've still got to go another three kilometers to get to the top of the world. That's a visual of a dead body being taken off the mountain. The clothing that I'm wearing is made by a company down in Cape Town called First Descent that protects your body for temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees. The coldest it got for me on that mountain was the night we summited. It was minus 34 degrees. I had no idea how claustrophobic I was going to feel with that oxygen mask on my face. I had that entire contraption on my face for 72 hours. One of the fundamental lessons that we learned from an incredible leader called Marty Schmidt, who was a New Zealander, is every three to four hours he'd say, take that mask off your face and hit it onto your boot. It was so freezing cold that that, ox that pipe, that red pipe going to my oxygen bo bottle, kept on freezing up. This is the most dangerous part of the climb. It's known as the death zone. At this point, you are at Camp 4, which is 8,000 meters in height. It's eight kilometers. People used to say to me, but Lee, why is it called the death zone? It's exactly that. If you cut yourself at this height, your body will no longer heal. The human body can no longer acclimatize. Your organs are starting to shut down because there's no oxygen. From those orange tents to the top of the world is 848 meters. How many meters in a kilometer? 
Just one, a thousand. So that is less than a kilometre. If you had a walk, one kilometre, how long would it take you? Five minutes, that's a fast walker. <laughs> Let's say 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that took me 14 and a half hours. I want to share something with you. I've been really fortunate. I've completed five full Ironman uh, endurance events. For anybody who doesn't know what the Ironman is, it's in PE. And you start with a 3.8 kilometer swim in the ocean. It's equivalent to 180 lengths at the Virgin Active. You get out of the ocean, then you get into your bike. You do 180 kilometers. It's like 294.7s. Then you get off your bike and you do a full 42 kilometer marathon. I've done the full Ironman in less time than what it took me to do 848 meters. And people used to say, but Lee, why were you so slow? I wasn't slow. I was exhausted, exhausted. When you are at that height, all your body wants to do is shut down. That's all you want to do. Do you know that medical researchers have proven if they had to take your human body right now and put you at camp, to, camp four, your body wouldn't last longer than two seconds. You'd be instantly unconscious, instantly. Our leader used to say, to us, no matter how cold you are, no matter how tired you are, do not stop moving. Do you know that in 2012, there was a group of British climbers that did stop moving, and they froze to death, and their bodies are still on that mountain. That's the second most dangerous part of the climb. It's known as the Hillary Step, also known as the Everest Traffic Jam. And then I have to tell you, so 14 and a half hours from the death zone, we got to the top of Everest. We started climbing from the summit. It was Saturday night, it was 7 o'clock at night, and the following morning at quarter to 10, I was standing on top of the world. That South African flag was signed by those beautiful children out of the Hartebeersburg Dam. Dam. And um, I had visualized this moment. I'd been carrying that South African flag in my pack for two months. And people had said to me, how did you feel, Lee? Were you euphoric? Was it like the best moment of your life? And I have to tell you, without being inappropriate, I kept on thinking to myself, shit, whatever has gone up has now got to go down. <laughs> It was minus 34 degrees, and the wind chill factor was minus 50. And there's good old Sangi 3, and the wind is pumping and pumping, and he's trying to help me get that flag out. And then I love to say, you just got to leave it to a woman. And I got that flag out on my own. <laughs> I want to... <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Mm. I want to share the key message of my talk. And as I said to you, my real talk, I really expand the Everest journey because I believe in life, everybody's got their own Everest to climb. I really, really do. And that is the two questions that I got asked as leader. Did you ever, ever think that you weren't going to make it? And ladies and gentlemen, I train every day. I do endurance events, and I'm unafraid of risks, and I take every opportunity that comes my way. I have to share with you that Everest was the hardest thing that I've ever, ever, ever done. I completely underestimated it. I had no idea how my body was going to feel at those heights because I'd never been so high. So my answer to that question was, I didn't think I was going to make it down. I didn't think so. Do you know Everest is like life? It's not how you start something, it's how you finish it. If you make it to the top of Everest, but you don't make it down, they don't count it as a summit. Okay. Because more people lose their lives on their way down. And I didn't think I was going to get down. I didn't think I was going to get back to the death zone. It had taken me 14 and a half hours to do 848 meters. It took me another nine and a half to do 848 meters coming down. And then the most important question that was asked is, when you thought Lee, you weren't going to make it, what was that thing that did make you make it? And ladies and gentlemen, I really believe in life. When your purpose is bigger than your challenge, there's absolutely no finish line that you cannot cross. Thank you very much. <laughs>